Damien Barrett, Wayne Carey, Daisy Thomas. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Joseph. It's great to be here. How good is the MCG? Any time you get the chance to come here, and especially, I think even more so when it obviously is full on grand final day, but there's an eeriness when it's completely empty like this and you're the only people here. It, it does, doesn't it? I've uh, been fortunate enough to get some of those uh, guys. There's 21 living um, guys who've kicked 100 goals in a season. I've been fortunate enough to get even the great Dunstall, great Jason Dunstall down into that pocket where he kicked one of his uh, six times on the 100 goals. And you're right, standing in it when it's empty, I, I think it's actually more compelling and powerful than it is when it's when it's full. It is a magnificent stadium, isn't it, looking over at the Shane Warne stand there. We're, we're privileged to come here uh, as a... Often as we do, but I didn't realise they still do this sort of stuff. The the, the lighting out there just to fresh days like today in in Melbourne where there's no sun, so they obviously uh, they have their own uh, lighting to give, <laughs> the, uh, to give the grass a little bit the of the UV uh, light stuff. True yeah. or false? You were down there with the shirt off twenty minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, yeah, you're looking tan. Yeah, you know, get, get a little bit of a tan. <laughs> nice <maybe>. option. <laughs> but you are right. We're very lucky we get to come here to go to work and we get to come yeah. to the MCG. Yeah. And it just had me thinking while I look out there. I don't think I've ever asked you, Duck, and I'm sure you'd be happy to share it. But what is your best game you've ever played here at the MCG? It was one that sticks out. And I'll ask you too, Daisy, where you just go, yeah, for me, that was probably my, my best game. Can I answer on your behalf? Oh, Damo. Oh, sure, Damo. Was, Damo. It, was, it the game, coat on. was it the game you and Lloydie went head-to-head -head and you kicked 10, he kicked 7, Essendon won, but you kicked that famous goal in that pocket, the uh, left foot inside our check. Oh, that no. one. We, that lost, one. we lost the game. You did, so but you kicked 10. You kicked 10 goals, yeah, but doesn't that count. doesn't count. Yep. I, I don't know. I think sometimes it, it's not – for me, it was never about – goals to be honest with you so I kicked 11 and 10 and nines and sevens and all that <laughs> no but it, I never rated my game on goals yep. I rated it more on possessions and marks influence and influence on the game so I, probably given that I had uh, one arm against Geelong in the wet oh yeah um you know 97 in a big final kick seven and um yeah we went we went through and ended up making a prelim when we finished seventh so Geelong finished second we finished seventh it was back when that occurred. So to kick seven in the wet on that night and have, I don't know, I think 27 or 28 possessions or something. Doesn't count know, goals though, Joey, but <laughs> kick, kick seven <laughs> on that night. No, but it's, no. it's a lot of the ball back then and, and yeah, in those conditions, probably uh, that one. Mm. Daisy? Uh, I had a game against West Coast here. I kicked a, a similar, not to your standard duck, but a, a left foot inside out check side. Uh, from this end, took a hanger on Nick Nat, uh, kicked three. Took a, a hanger on Nick Nat. Took a hanger on Nick Nat. <laughs> on, on Nick Nat Nui. On Nick you Nat sat Nui on him. On the point post and then unselfishly squared it up to Scotty Pendlebury. Um, <laughs> kicked three, had 35. Was one of those days where ever you went or whatever you did, it just turned to go. You announced yourself on it. Was that in 2010? Is that 2010 when Russell Lyon said you were the best player in the comp? No. Nah, it, it would have been somewhere in there. I think he's rostered <laughs> that a few times. Too. Joey, come on. You've got yeah. 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 You're asking this question because you want to yeah. yeah. No, nah, not really. No, I. <laughs> I think a bit like that. Probably for me, that one that sticks out, 2010 prelim against the Western Bulldogs was probably not my best best game overall, but I think for the influence, the importance of it in a prelim, I think they officially gave Nick Rewalt best player in the paper and I was second best, but I think I had Rui covered. <laughs> yeah. But again, they always, they always just go to the big names. I think Rui kicked three and had 15 or something, probably 12 marks. And I once wrote a really um, good match report from yes. a game at the MCG. Yeah. yeah, so um, it, was really, it was really good. Yeah, <laughs> Round 16, two, whatever it was. How did you used to do it in the old days? Did you actually sit up here in the sort of boxes and actually yeah. write a match report as the game was going on? I just love the old one. This one's been, this best box is from 2006 um, when they revamped this, this side of the stadium for the Commonwealth Games. But prior of that it was under underneath here and it was a famous old wooden bench and seatings and yeah it was a, I, I love that old one it was so old it was uh, archaic and falling over but um it was some history it was always full. and you all scribbled your own notes and yeah. have a little cheat and just say oh what's he written over well there? you didn't get stats in those days yeah. so you, you were exposed for what you <laughs> did or didn't know about footy uh very good hey plenty going on it was a big weekend we sort of i think we sort out a little bit do you reckon from the yeah. the boys from the men a little bit the, the contenders and the pretenders well we found out a little bit didn't we we found out that carlton uh, stood up under all sorts of pressure. Um, Brisbane faltered a little bit. So, you know, are they as good as what everyone thought they were, especially here in Melbourne? So there, there were a few questions answered, I reckon, Joey. It was interesting. We had that long discussion last week about Melbourne and where they were at and whether or not our perception of them was going to completely change. And I think a lot of people are now back on and firmly, yeah. for good reason, back on that bandwagon. You know, Sydney, yeah, 
ticks and Kilda, you know, yeah. are they just dropping off the cliff? So there's there, there were a lot of questions. And Geelong doing, in my eyes, everything right at this stage of this year. And Richmond losing, but losing no admirers with yeah. their performance as well. And they sit outside the eight, yet there's a part of me that thinks they would be the scariest team to play mm. uh, if and when they do play finals. And arguably the easiest, if there is such thing as an easy draw. No, that draw, and we've spoken about this a lot, there's only one team now that you've, you've, you've marked down. On form. Yeah. Absolutely marked down. Now West Coast, and they've Nick Nat has come out this week and said mm. they want to fo- they want to shape the eight. And I said that I reckon last week or the week before, Joey, that I love the fact that these teams now will will shape the eight, except for North. Yeah, and West Coast I think got sixteen or seventeen. Premiership or elite players back in that side. They only had about six kids on the weekend. So you're right with Nick Nat coming back. And I can't believe Daisy that some of us thought that North Melbourne oh. may have been a chance to beat Adelaide. I, Looking back in hindsight. I I would have actually liked to have gone down to North Melbourne and just give them a piece of my mind. Just <laughs> shake some cages. What is going on? If I could get that up and about and have the belief that they're going to go out and find something. If I was a North player last week, I would have been going to everyone and sort of just a little locker room chat you have saying, hey, we're going to win this. This is our week. We will get this done. For them to come out and do what they did, they left Ben Mackay up forward, which was a nice option to start with. But then if he's not having a kick and you realise that Texas is kicking six and uh, Fogarty's going to take the game away from you, maybe put your best defender in the bloody back line and stop some goals. Insipid organisation well, at the moment. Well, good lead in because, Damo, we want to continue on the saga that is North Melbourne. What is yeah. the latest happening there? Jeff Walsh coming to the footy club. There's plenty more news as well. Luke Jackson, the De Koning boys, they're taking the competition by storm. We'll get to all that after this because this is Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub. It's now time for Damo, the news, and let's start with the Kangaroos as we were talking about them before the break. Yeah, we will because they've... Uh... They've now got a stretch of matches that, that goes uh, 10 long where they have had their best result amongst those 10 matches of being a 47-point loss. It takes some doing to lose. I think it's a record, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's the longest record of, of that amount of loss at, at that magnitude of loss. And there's two other losses tacked onto that too. That just they weren't as big as the 47 being the, the lowest losing margin they've had in that in that stretch. The only win they've had is against West Coast when they were completely off the rails and and, and partially to, to what Daisy's uh, point was. They, they, there was just no spark, is there? And there hasn't been all year. And and then you get the situation where they bring in Jeff Walsh, who Joey has twice um, left the football club in paid positions, once as chief executive officer, once as, as head of the football department, both times to go to Collingwood. And then they um, decide to tap him on the shoulder and bring him back to tell them what's wrong with the joint. I mean, there's no one there making the decisions. They're now consulting. Paul Ruse is still on their books as a consultant all the way from Hawaii. Jeff Walsh is coming back in as an outsider, in inverted commas, this time to, to again, tell them what they need to do. There's there's board directors, there's um, football directors on the board, and there's a CEO and, and, and a chairperson. I was going to ask that. Is that not the role of the footy director? Aren't yeah. they the ones employed, or yeah. not employed, but are on the, in that position to make those decisions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's my take on it too. And Glenn right. Archer was in that role for some years, and it got too hard for him. He then tapped uh, his mate Anthony Stevens to come onto the board in that role, and Anthony Stevens and just tap Jeff Walsh on the shoulder to come and do the job. The problem is they're all inexperienced in their jobs. In all the, and I've spoken about this before. In all of those leadership roles, they're all they're all new. Yep. So I don't I don't think any of them have the uh, maybe. And this I probably shouldn't speak on behalf of them, but it looks like to me none of them have the real uh, confidence to to be really harsh. Where I reckon Jeff Walsh does and yeah. if it means Jeff's going to come in there and 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 say it how how it is, and I'm all for it. And I hope that's exactly what he does because the concern for me, I've said it, I've said it week after week after week, is I have not seen any improvement, not from the young. Oh, there's been a, there's been games where a few of the players have you, you go, oh well, you know, you can see a little bit of improvement. None of the senior players have stood up. Um, the, the the talented ones that we thought were going to go to a whole new level, I don't need to name names. Everyone knows who they are. They haven't gone to where we thought they'd gone. So therefore, the development of the players through through lack of leadership on the ground have not has not been anywhere near where it should be. Um, the coach clearly isn't getting the message through. So they're, they're, I mean, it's 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 a shambles. And I hope while she just and I, I know you can't throw out. You can't throw out any more players. They can't do that. They've obviously got to go to the draft, but what they do have to do is while she has to make some key decisions around the development and clearly the recruiting, the development and the coach. They're the three areas and I'm taught this is on ground. Yep. That's what's got to be made. Daisy, something needs to change because it doesn't matter about the talent or the age demographic. 
effort and spirit. Yeah. It doesn't matter how old or how many games you've played. You can bring that, and it doesn't, doesn't seem they're bringing that effort and spirit that's required. Well, that's the thing is, you know, there's people now out of the game, but we obviously played a large portion of it. You can see that. That's tangible when you go to the footy. Watching that on the weekend, as I said, I was more up and about, and I felt that I was more up and about <laughs> and more <laughs> bullish on their chances than and half they were. the players were. And, yeah. you know, the fact that you understand that, yes, if you come up against Melbourne, you're still going to bring the effort and the intensity with the realisation that you probably are a 10-goal worse side. But against an Adelaide, you sit there and go, we bring it this week. We can really catch them. Chance to win a game of footy, which should be the best part of your week. They just aren't looking like they're enjoying what they're doing. Uh, it's interesting. And Doug, you spoke the other week. They need to figure out what is actually wrong. Put some ownership on it. Realise they have the issue and then go and fix it. So hopefully that's what Walshie can do. Joey, Luke Jackson's situation gets more intriguing by, by the week because we're now entering round 16 and he's out of contract. And again, all, all you can do in these times is reflect what the industry is saying. And, and what it's saying right now is that he's gone and that not just is he going to Perth, but specifically going to Fremantle. Now, you say all of that knowing that he may just wake up at some stage between now and close off play before the trade period finishes and say, you know what, I'm going to stay a bit longer. But right now, that's what all the clubs are talking about. And it's interesting interesting that it's Fremantle that has got itself, to this point anyway, way ahead of West Coast when it comes to getting his interest. Um, look, we weren't to know this at the time, but they were so methodical and prepared and strategic about the pursuit of Lockie Neal this time last year. We only knew about that after Lockie Neal's season had finished at Brisbane. Now, we know that he has recommitted to the Lions yesterday to, for another four, three years added to the year he already had on his contract. So... You just know that they will have had every um, I dotted and T crossed in terms of getting Luke Jackson to their club. Now, again, it's yet to play out that way, but that's the landscape. It's interesting when you are in this position. Generally, if you're coming from a team that's really successful like Melbourne and you're going somewhere for big dollars, it's not to another team that's going to be really challenging in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. So I think that decision for Luke Jackson... He's probably made a touch easier knowing that I'm not walking away from Melbourne who potentially could go on and win the or at least compete for two, three, four seasons. If you go to a free man or you're looking at their window going, geez, well, that's probably coming up in the next two, three, four seasons. So you're not uh, exactly comparing apples to oranges. It's more almost apples to apples. How many players in the modern game have been in Luke Jackson's position and left a club at, under mm -hmm. under a potential tag, Joey. Now, he's, he's, he's shown a little bit on that potential, but it's still potential. He, yeah. Hasn't, yeah. Reached, he hasn't won BNFs or anything like that. How many have gone to another club and, and excelled? Been successful. Because I was going to say Tom Boyd was one, but he, I mean, he won a premiership. Well, he yeah. won a premiership, but he, didn't, know he, he didn't excel in terms of uh, consistency over his whole time at the Dogs. He it's excelled. unusual, Doug, isn't it? The, the managers usually uh, ensure that the player stays for four years minimum and, and often six. And I Buddy mean, Franklin was different because Buddy Franklin had already yep. excelled. Yeah. So he had already Chris Judd, reached a level. Chris, Chris Judd had, had already six reached, years. Had yeah. already reached yeah. a level. Already yeah. a Brownlow medalist. Yeah. We're talking about someone that hasn't reached that top potential and going to leave. I just wonder I, – I don't think – I can't remember too many. Mm. I mean, you, you think of um, – that went from Melbourne to GWS. Uh, number Tom one. Tom Scully. Tom Scully didn't work. There's one, yeah. Uh, so there's a, yep. there's, uh, yeah. I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm not sure you. But not sure from whose perspective because that's not. Is that because it puts Luke, pressure? That, so it you're saying pressure. yeah, Luke Jackson should be taking that into consideration for himself. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It, add, it adds pressure. Reach. He's got plenty of time. He could sign a, a two year deal at Melbourne, so get another two years out and still be in the same position to go back home mm. in two years. It's extraordinary given, given really, if he does only serve the three years at Melbourne, the down payment he's given them on the p use of pick three in the 2019 draft, what he did in the 15 minutes of the grand final was enough payment on that. And I think he's done it beyond that. Barry Hall's maybe one. Like left St Kilda was, a, was an up and coming key forward and then went to Sydney and excelled. Brian Lake? No, Brian Lake was towards the end of his career. Brian Lake yeah. played his last three yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, keep going. We'll talk about young, young up-and-coming stars. What about the Deconing boys and what yeah. they've done with the competition this season? Oh, I think it's extraordinary, Joey. I mean, look, we, we knew of their reputations. Um, I mean, Sam went in the in the first round uh, for for um for the Cats, and and Tom went about number 38, 39. So they were they had reputations, but to think in the space of fifteen rounds of twenty twenty two, they've they've come through extraordinarily. Where where I'd argue that they're I mean, we use the phrase most important, crucial. You, you take both of those players out of Geelong and Carlton, I, I think it takes away a lot of the big dreams they've both been able to have because of the roles 
they've been able to play quite miraculously to this point of this year. Yeah, great athletes, uh, good in the air, good on the deck, got speed. So they've got all the, they've got all the attributes. And the other thing that they've got, having watched uh, them live this year, is they've got a little bit of they've got a little bit of mongrel. Mm. They, they, you can tell there's a lot yeah. of pride in performance. They want to play well, and I get the feeling they want to be a star. They actually want to get to that next level. Mm. That's that's what it looks like from for me. So early Daisy Duck Dive question. Ooh. Who would you take if you could <laughs> choose? You could either have both King Boys yeah. or you could have both De Konings. With what you've seen from the two of them, the De Konings would probably oh. play a bit more uh, different positions, but do the Kings stand out to you still? Yeah, pocket Kings always for me. Yep. I'm mm. taking the De Konings, Joey. That's a mm. great question, Joey. I just say, thought of it. I'm, 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 it's one that we discussed on I'm AFL Daily because, yesterday. Oh, yeah. so I didn't listen. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, Sorry, did. I didn't listen of, to AFL Daily. Of versi- I normally do. <laughs> because of versatility, I'm going to say De Kooning. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's got me That's... thinking. I'm asked a question without even thinking the answer myself. I just love what they're doing. <laughs> it's pretty, It's good to watch. And yeah. to think, I'm pretty sure the uh, long De Kooning was a forward as well. So to get him in the back line almost out of necessity and then for him to come on in leaps and bounds as he has – what has it been? 13 games this season. He's been incredible. Yeah. He's go- actually going to play on Geelong's. De Koning's going to actually play on both Kings at some point yes. during the year yeah. in the future. Now, De Koning's got more uh, versatility, but I think both King boys are capable of kicking 70 goals a season. And, Which is pretty handy. Yeah. So I'll take the Kings. Stick with that. Uh, Damo, just quickly, last one. Richmond. Uh, Liam Baker. Yeah. And the transformation of him as a player. Just wanted to throw it up and get the guys in, in your view too, obviously, Joey, on, on on how big a role he has played. And again, a little bit like the De Konings, his ability has always been there, but it's it snuck up on us in terms of how extreme and high-end it can be. And, and even that performance most recently against Geelong on the weekend, he, he turned that game to the point where they nearly won it because of him. And I don't think you would have said that about him this time last year. No, you wouldn't say that about many players in the competition that literally the minute he went on ball changed the complexion of a game. Yeah. That's normally you know, for the for Dangerfield and Fife and Dustin Martin to do that sort of thing, let alone someone like Liam he's Baker. Just, he's clean. He's tough. He's tough. Good decision hard. maker. He's, yeah. he's creative. He's more yeah. creative than all, I realised. All, yeah. of, all of the above. Um, you just admire him. I, I, Yeah, I love him. He changed the game against Port Adelaide as well. He was playing half back, right, went to yeah. half forward, and yeah. he had 15, uh, 12 or 13 possessions in that last quarter. His ability to play anywhere on the ground is the key. Not too many can be really competent in every position. Yes, you can fling them every now and then and might work. We've seen Danger go forward, Dusty go to full forward. But his cleanliness and decision-making is first-rate. And left-right as well. Yeah. You know what it says mm. to me, Duck? Size doesn't matter. No, it no. doesn't. Nope, it doesn't matter because he's only short, but he's got the job done. Hey, thank you, Damo. That's plenty of footy news. Nothing else there? You're all good? All right, well, after this, we'll do the Daisy Duck Dive Top 5. This is Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub. This is where I'll fire questions at both Daisy and Duck. They haven't had any notice, and I want to get off the fence and give us a strong view. First question, after the loss to Melbourne uh, last Thursday, do you think there will be scars for Brisbane Lions players when they play finals this year? Oh, scars against Melbourne in particular or just scars in general? Scars, whether they think they're good enough, whether they think they can beat Melbourne. There probably has to be a little... They doubt themselves now. Probably has to be a little bit of doubt. We all know how close they were last year in that final against the Western Bulldogs. Interesting will be the learnings from that game against Melbourne because Melbourne played after a quarter time the near on perfect game. For Brisbane, it couldn't have gone much worse. So in terms of a blueprint of what you need to not do next time, you've pretty much got it. We've all played footy before. I remember when I first started. So for all the the, the younger players in the, in the Brisbane team now, I remember coming up against Hawthorne in the early 90s when we were just a young team and you just ran out going, we can't beat, we're just not going to beat this team, especially on this particular ground. Uh, so there, there, there is scarring. There are, you, you do go into games, I reckon, sort no, of having, Knowing you're not going to win. Having some self-doubt. But when you're young. Yeah, you're right. Young, you get to a point where you think you can beat anyone. Yep. But when you're young, there is there is a little bit of doubt. Uh, when Brody Grundy comes back into the side for Collingwood, what do you think they should do with the ruck situation oh. with Darcy Cameron emerging as an elite ruck? That's a really good one. He's been fantastic, Darcy Cameron. It's, it's easy for me to answer that. Okay. For me, it's quite simple. You, you, you look Grundy, the All-Australian, probably BNF winner, is he, at Collingwood? But anyway, he's All-Australian. Two, two times All-Australian. Two-time All-Australian. Yeah. You look at him and say, that's how we want you to play. We need you to play tall. We need you to play big. We need you to mark in defence. We need you to mark forward. We need you to hit it to our we, – we don't want you to be a midfielder. We want you to be a ruckman. Put it back on him. 
Yeah, another great problem to have for the Pies. So, yeah, he's still, I think, the number one ruckman. Of course. Cameron has excelled in replacing him and, and trying to fill that void whilst he's out. But, yeah, to your point, Duck, go and say, he's done a great job. Come and show us why you're the man. And then, Joey, I'll put this to you. Do you then play Mason Cox as a, as a triumvirate when it comes to the... the no, no, for me, when Brody Grundy's fit, I just have those two. I wouldn't have Cox in the side. I think Grundy and Cameron can play for alternate forward ruck, split it 50-50 and, and my check down there as well. Uh, where do you sit on the Bombers' future? Are you, are you half glass full? Are you bullish about where the Bombers are going or have you got real concerns about not only just this year but for next season as well? Bullish is probably too optimistic even for me. Um, I'll be always half full on them. I think that this will be... You know, the, the season's obviously done, so now it comes down to what they're going to do from this point on and then try and get some sort of jump start into next year. We think we talked a lot about Melbourne when they missed out on finals after making Make a, a prelim, making a prelim yeah. and just then that's when it's almost the wake-up call you need as an organisation, not just as a football club, but okay, we maybe took some things for granted over the pre-season. As players, you know you're going to have a bloody long, hard and tough pre-season. But the rewards you get on the back of that are all worth it. We all know that. So for me, I'm not completely bullish, but I'd be hopeful that they can turn it around. Got they've got some real talent on their list. I think they've they're missing some key component c- components. I think they've got uh, some problems up the spine, um, but uh, they're 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 young talent, and they, a few of those guys have been out for a little bit of this year. I understand that. But uh, I'm I'm bullish that they could bounce quickly if they got a few key decisions right in this off season. Yep, good. I'm a, I agree. I'm pretty bullish on them. You're, you're right about Melbourne. They won eight games after playing at a prelim. Richmond played finals 2014, they, 2014 and 15. Then in 20, 13, 14, 15. And then in 16 they Missed. won uh, they won five games. I think or six games and, uh, and then, then bounced. Then won three games. flags. Not but, saying Essendon will win three but, flags, but you can have a down year where you probably. Either overrate where you're at a little bit, or overcomplicate things, or just get a bit of ahead of where you're at. It's a little, it's a little bit, real, it's a little bit different. They're they're in a little bit different to the, all those teams you mentioned there. Richmond had won 14, 15 home and away games the two years prior to dropping off, and then bounced that year. Um, and who was the other one? Melbourne and Melbourne. Melbourne Got made a a, Melbourne made a prelim and looked like they could actually go through to the yeah. grand final. So it, it, there is a few as opposed to limping in like Essendon almost did last year. Hey, we speak about the uh, most underrated, important player in a team. Off the back of uh, Liam Baker at Richmond. A couple of clubs, I want you to give me who you think's underrated but so important that maybe don't get the uh, accolades they deserve. Starting with Geelong. I'll say Parfit. Mm. Yeah, I think, he's, uh, I think he's underrated and I think he's really, really important. I'm going with Tom Atkins from the Cats. His ability to go play on ball. He gives them a different dynamic and dimension when he goes in. There's something different to what they have. We know Danger's the big bull explosive one. Salwood's still hard as a goat's knee in there. He's just doing some different things. And when that game was on the line the other night, it was almost he was the one who stood up. What about Sydney? Sydney for me, Florent. Yeah, good one. Young up-and-comer that I just feel now when he plays really well, just takes the pressure off Parker and everyone else in and around Mills and everyone. But he's just clean, uses it really well, got good speed. I like him. Played really well on the weekend he against did. the Saints. Big Logan McDonald. I'm loving yeah? what he's doing up really? forward there. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, taking some pressure and that load off Buddy. And if anything, you know, he clunks it really nicely. So the second tall defender doesn't have the option to play off and then come assist when Buddy gets out. I think they have to make it a little bit of a, just on Sydney, they have to make a little bit of an adjustment now and say, you know what, McDonald, you are the main target. And I know it's very hard to say that to Buddy, but Buddy's never been a pack mark anyway, so I don't know why they're kicking it to him in those situations. Buddy, you play like a half-forward flanker and you get to front and square and you crumb and you do all the things and just read the game how you want to read it, but no longer get caught in the middle of a pack. So do you think it'll actually be easier on Franklin's body to play higher up the ground than it is to play out of the goal square like some people think you should play out of the goal square and float forward and just and you know come forward with the footy when he wants to and when he doesn't want to Joey sit behind it a little bit and almost set up defensively and sort of read the game a little bit and then go back in a quickly last one right now who's the rising star favorite who should win rising star from here we haven't asked for a few weeks Nick Dacos I'm still completely buying he's been unbelievable the start of his season incredible yeah probably through the slight middle part there he might have just been racking up some numbers without impact on games to the level we saw at the early part but his last month Yes, he's sort of been to halfback duck, but his impact, his ability to win the ball, use the ball, no surprises why Collingwood are improving, and a lot of it is on the back of what that young man's doing. Yeah, I still think Newcomb will be 
will be high. I think he's had a, an unbelievable year. Um, but I think the Coning will, by the end of the year, will be the winner of it because of who he plays on. And, uh, and, and look, Nick's had an unbelievable year, but sitting off a halfback flank, just racking up possessions, very different to playing on the key big guy of the opposition every week and doing well on them. So I think the Coning by the end of the year, the Geelong de Coning I'm talking about. Sam. This is Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub, and uh, we're going to have a look at the Round 16 action. We all had a mixed bag last week. Daisy, you threw a few threw Hail Marys out there. You went for the, <laughs> the Hawks to beat the Dogs. You went for North Melbourne to beat Adelaide. You took the Suns to beat Port Adelaide. But we won't worry about We're that. We're laughing at the Suns, aren't we? They lost by two points. Hawthorne went 25 points up. North Melbourne's the only one I'll accept. At least I didn't say Melbourne weren't going to make the eight, you drunk. <laughs> yeah, Joey. Are you still over oh, your carton for Oh, that? no. I forgot to bring the oh, carton Oh, yeah, of course in. you did. Oh, Daisy and I had a beer bet for our Thursday night. He gave me a 15-point start for Brisbane. I, I, I took it. I would have taken that first one you that was on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I do owe you a Peroni Reds. Just um, um, Peroni, Peroni Reds. Reds. I'll get them through to you. A, a loyal listener, Duck, Mel9907, uh, she yeah. DM'd me her tipping results. She got nine from nine last week. So this week. is genius. So she said, <laughs> Not even nine eight. from she nine. nine eight. According <laughs> to the King, Wayne Carey, I am a genius. So, <laughs> yeah. Mel, well done to you. Well done, yeah. Mel. You get a plug on the uh, on the midweek rub. Hey, let's take a look at this week because starting with Thursday night, Brisbane v Western Bulldogs. This is a big game uh, at the Gabba. I can see the Western Bulldogs really oh. troubling Brisbane with their ball movement. I think the dogs are going really nicely. They're my outsider for the weekend. Fill up job for me, Brisbane Lions. Yep, comfortably. <laughs> okay. I love it. Yep. Oh. Oh, a, a, a tough one for me. I, I might tip the Bulldogs in that, only because I'm not sure they've got the right mix at the moment, Brisbane, especially uh, up four, that is. The three tools? Yeah. You're a bit slightly concerned? Yeah, I'm slightly concerned. I, uh, You've been talking about this for a few weeks. Yeah. yeah. I, so I don't think they've quite – and I just think the dogs are just starting to click. They're just starting to click for me. No more – oh, sorry, no more, but no English again. Ed Richards out, and obviously Bailey Smith still serving yeah. various suspensions. Yeah, I, just, I didn't take that into consideration. Maybe you just talk me out. <laughs> well, that's, that's what you've got to do when you I thought, I thought um, English was coming. Well, well so, sorry, when I say no English, as, as we speak, that they they are led. we're led to believe they're going to err on the side of the 12 days being up on the day of the game. And as such, we'll err on the side of caution. But again, let's wait for the teams to be. Mm. Yeah, but that, that was yeah, the. Okay. That's well, been the if report English all week. Plays, yep. I'll go with the dogs. Yep. Okay. Uh, can anyone see St Kilda upsetting Carlton Friday night Marvel Stadium, or are the Blues just travelling beautifully? No, I can't see it, but I wouldn't fall off the chair if it happened. No, Weirdly enough, yeah. 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 But, I'm the, the nervous Carlton supporter this week. You were the nervous St Kilda supporter yeah. the other week. I'm the nervous Carlton supporter in this one. I think they win. Hmm. And I hope they win, but again, wouldn't be falling off chairs if it was a, a close game and Saints got it done. I actually think the opposite. I think their belief, they're really starting to believe now the Blues. And I think they, they, they've they got the injured Impala, which is St Kilda. Their belief's down, and I reckon Carlton's is right up, and I think Carlton win. I'm expecting St Kilda to bring their best effort. I think they have to. Just they whether, to, they're, whether their game's in good enough shape with uh, their ball movement and, and behind the footy to beat the Blues, I'm not overly confident, but What's I think they'll have cracked. in your eyes in the last... Three weeks. There's, but no, it's been it's been over eight weeks. It's actually been coming yeah. for, for a long time. They were, they were five and one after round six. And eight and they've three. Gone th- yeah, eight and three. But two so, of those wins in the in the previous three weeks. With North and Adelaide. Yep. Yeah. So it, it's been just quietly building. So I'm not sure. I think it's off the back of their pressure. Their pressure dropped away early in the season. I started red hot, dropped away, and then I think they struggle to then get easier goal. Max King doesn't get his easy goals off turnover. They have to move the ball a bit uh, a bit more from the back half, which they struggle with. And then Jack Steele was a big out as well around the clearances. They look, at, they look a different team without Ryder. Yeah. Yeah, that's the concern as well internally. So big issues at the Saints. What about Essendon, Sydney at the MCG? I'm going to throw this up again early. I can see the Bombers pushing Sydney Swans in this one. The Bombers last month have actually been much better. I can see them pushing the Swans. Well, they're, they're so hard to catch, Essendon. Anytime you think they're going to do something, they almost do the complete opposite and make you look like mugs. I can't have them. I can't tip them. I think I tipped them earlier in the year and they let me down, so I'm tipping Sydney. They can get stuffed. Their history, they've got a great history, these two. Yeah, Played close a games. Lot of, lot of close games. But I, I, I agree with you, Daisy. I just can't, I just can't tip Essendon. I, yep. I've got to go with Sydney. On the same, I know they've had a, a relatively topsy-turvy patch here, the Swans, but I, I don't have them that much lower than Carlton in terms of what could happen if it all clicks, and I reckon they're about to click. What about Gold Coast Collingwood up at Metricon Stadium? The Gold Coast, their profile is is elite. Like they have the number one defence in the competition for about eight weeks now. Very unlucky not to beat Port Adelaide in Adelaide, who, duck, as we know, are in red-hot form. 
Are Gold Coast still a sneaky chance happy, to play finals? I'm happy to tip Gold Coast in this game. I think Gold Coast at home will will uh, beat Collingwood. Oh, this, I think this is going to be a cracker. I'll be sitting down to watch this one. Gold Coast at home, will that affect the way the Pies move the ball a little bit? The slippery conditions probably can't be as risky and as uh, up and about and aggressive with your balls through the corridor. I'm going to tip the pies purely because I don't tip them enough and I'm getting some pretty strong feedback from the uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm but on the back of that, if I get let down this week, uh, pie supporters, you're on notice. I won't be listening ever again. I'm glad you're not the only one. I've been underrating the pies for the majority of the season. Yeah. I tip against them a lot. I'm not going to do it anymore. I think their game stacks up yeah. in any conditions. Whether really? it's okay. wet, dry, yep. they surge, they get it moving forward. So, And to appease all the pies fans that, that are just hanging on me, I'm going to go for Collingwood to beat the Gold Coast Suns and keep that role going. Well, I'm going for Gold Coast, Joey, with, with some confidence. I've got I got, to go, uh, yeah. I got to go into Pie Land the other week yes. uh, on the weekend. The environment Craig McRae has created there for blokes just happy to talk up, ask questions in meeting, absolutely incredible. No real surprise as to how that's translating on field and the confidence they're bringing into games. Uh, Port Adelaide's form stacks right up. 3-0 Port Adelaide. And oh. they beat them by... Yeah, oh, sorry, you talking about sorry. the Gold Coast. Yep. And they got beaten by two points. And yep. they were down by a little bit to come yeah, back. it was crazy. So for me, Gold Coast form sits right up there. So expectation is Gold Coast should win at home against a team that is around about them and the ladder. That's, is that yep. where they've got to yeah, now? Yep, Which is a great credit so. to them, Damo, isn't it? The it Gold is. Coast are in that situation. A- Would you sign Stewie Jew if they win this week, Damo? Yep. <laughs> no, because my point I made last week, <laughs> they uh, win this days, week. Uh, they're still not in the eight. Uh, and I wouldn't be signing him right now. I wouldn't be signing Brett Ratton right now either. Oh, Duck tough. saying yes. I reckon if they show, I reckon if they beat Collingwood on the weekend, when you think about how many rounds there to go, I think you just look at Stewie Jew and you look at what they're doing and you say, you know what, you're, you're the right man. This, this is a big game. And I think they can do it. I'm sure they'll re-sign Stewie Jr. now. Hey, last one. It's off-Broadway, but it's a huge game. Fremantle v Port Adelaide. We spoke about Port Adelaide's form. They are still knocking on the door of the eight. This is massive for them. This keeps their finals hopes alive if they can win. Fremantle just stuttering a little bit in recent weeks. This is the upset game for me, Joey. Um, Potential upset game. Port Adelaide to beat the the Dockers over there in Perth. I'm going to go with Fremantle for the same reasons why I tipped Fremantle last week against Carlton. I think their defenders stack up really well against Port Adelaide's forwards. So uh, I think Frio. Yeah, Frio at home for me. I think they uh, straighten the ship again. It's always nice when they get back home after a bad week and they just sort of figure it out pretty quickly. Yeah, I think the Dockers at home will be okay, but Port are an absolute challenge. Hey, this has been another great edition of Triple M Footy's Midweek Rub, of course, from the MCG. We'll be here again next week as well. And you can listen to us exclusively on exclusively on the Listener app. Don't forget you can listen to every game across Round 16 this weekend and on the Listener app starting Thursday night with BT, Simon Black, Richard Champion and Liam Flanagan ahead of the Brisbane Lions via the Western Bulldogs. Thanks for listening. We'll do it all again next Wednesday.